We apologize for the delayed uh, start, but uh, it is the 24th day of 2018. So in case you have certain things that you want to do or plans that you plan, depending so much on your New Year's resolutions, you're just 24 days into 2018. You need to fasten uh, your speed to ensure you get to your goals or to slow down. Also, maybe to revisit your goals and see 24 days into 2018, did you set things that are not achievable or are you within your means? So think about that. Mm, sometimes you only remember when we are mid weather year or a few days to the end of the year and we think about our resolutions. To the parent, today is the 24th and senior one selections are beginning. So you need to know what words are you going to speak to your child. Maybe the school you preferred, the first choice is not the school they have made it. Or even none of the schools has selected him or her. What are the words that you're supposed to tell this child? You know, th remember this is their first national examination. So today selections are beginning and we hope that the parents, the guardians, you have the right words no matter what the outcomes of the selection might be. It is a current affairs show where we make it a point that we update you with what is happening globally and locally. I'm Robert Chirabo, New Newton. Good morning once again and welcome to GMU Agenda where we look at an issue of national concern and today we are going to assess and look at the 22 years since the NRM liberation. Remember on the 26th we are going to be celebrating this day that is at Boma Grounds in Arua and with me is uh, Uganda's Deputy Permanent Representative to the UN Ambassador Chintu Nyago who is an NRM cadre and of course is here to tell us a few things of the struggle and their achievements on the as we look at at 32 years of liberation. Ambassador, you're most welcome Thank to you, GMU. Thank you, Mr. Chirabo. Uh, to begin with, Ambassador, we are going to be celebrating 32 years since the 41 with 27 guns started this journey that Ugandans, many of us, are enjoying the peace that has pre prevailed for all this time. Ambassador, are we still on course? Because Ugandans might be looking at the wrong, long period of time, but not looking at maybe are we still on course? Thank you, Mr. Chirabo. I think uh, many of the objectives mm. have been realized. For mm. example, there was the objective of uh, having democracy the country and today Uganda is a democratic country there may be challenges but uh, there are regular elections we have uh, parliament we have local governments uh, and well there is democratic institutions there's freedom of, of the press for example uh, another of the key achievements has been uh, our contribution say even internationally regionally for example you find that uh, Uganda now is uh, in Somalia Somalia had problems problems in a way similar to the ones we had here. But Uganda, President Museveni and uh, you know, the government of Uganda and the region contributed greatly to uh, establishing a peace force called AMISOM or the Peace Force for the Africa Union in relation, in conjunction with the United Nations to stabilize Somalia and it has helped a lot to bring about some peace in Somalia. Had we not done that, we would have had worse problems than the ones we had in 2010 when we were attacked by Al-Shabaab or even Kenya has many problems. So we were containing global terrorism. Uganda has also played a very key role in uh, stabilizing of South Sudan. We have contributed in the stabilizing of South Sudan. And also Uganda, President Museveni is the mediator in the Burundi peace process. Internally here, also other issues have been achieved. For example, gender. Women now have a voice in Uganda, or have a, have a, a, a bigger voice, or bigger role in the management of our society than they were before 1986. Mm -hmm. Education has also improved, among its others. Mm -hmm. 
uh, we've talked, you've talked about education, democracy. These are achievements still of the NRM, which many can see, obviously. But let's look at uh, empowering Ugandans in terms of improving their livelihood, uh, in terms of improving the economy. The economy, Mr. Chita, was improved. Uh, the economy now is much better than it was. You find that there's more investments. You find, uh, uh, at one time they were saying that, um, a statistic that exists says that in 1986, I think Uganda was collecting, the government of Uganda was collecting taxes worth then 5 billion shillings. Now we are collecting a lot of money, much more, say possibly 15 trillion or something like that. So you can see that the economy has definitely improved in that regard. There's, there's more construction and uh, people are wealthier. But that said, there are still some challenges. We need to ensure that uh, we broaden further the, the, the economic gains. We need to ensure that the social sector, social services uh, further broaden, for example, UPE. We need more schools, like you say in Kampala, we need more schools for universal education and technical education and even work so district uh, and so forth. Mm. Mr. Chintunyago, anyone who was in Uganda by then and comes back to Uganda today automatically the success stories are visible. But key question is, are we moving at the right speed? 32 years, is this where Uganda should be? Well, there has been a report by the Harvard mm -hmm. Business School, which is projecting Uganda to grow, at, uh, to, to be the fastest growing economy in a few years to come, which highlights the, the fact that uh, uh, we're on the right track. For sure, I mean, this is not heaven where there's perfection. Mm -hmm. We could possibly improve, mm -hmm. and definitely there is need for improvement, say, in terms of uh, providing better infrastructure in some of the areas where it's not. Mm -hmm. uh, as I've said, education requires to be deepened, universal education requires to be deepened in all areas of the country. So those are some of the factors that uh, are skilling the population. We need uh, uh, take, uh, you know, vocational schools in the urban areas like Kampala and Wakiso where there are many youths who are possibly uh, getting unemployed or are unemployed yeah. already. So they need to be skilled if they are to contribute meaningfully to, the, to, to this uh, uh, mm. economic growth. Mm. Well, uh, also I want us to look at the fact that one of the reasons that uh, saw the journey of the Liberation War uh, begin was instability, mm. lack of democracy. Mm. Today, Uganda, we have elections, like rightly put up, put it, or emphasize that. But how are we doing in the term of democracy, Uganda, at 32 years since the Liberation War? Regarding stability, Mr. Kirabo, another of the achievements has been that uh, for the first time, Uganda as an entire country is secure. Secure in the sense that you find, for example, in 19, uh, early 80s, Karamoja had problems because after the removal of the Idi Amin government, the people of Karamoja, some Karamojong people, uh, raided the military barracks and got guns. And there was a big problem of cattle rustling within Karamoja initially and then also regionally. The Karamojong began even you know, attacking their neighbors. So Karamojong was, became, over time, ungovernable because of the small arms that had proliferated in that area. That was solved. Now, there was the war in Luero, which caused enormous damage to that area. And uh, people are yet to recover from that. And the Obote government failed to contain that insurgency. But now, there is no more insurgency in the Luero Triangle. Then, after the NRM came to power, there were many insurgencies, one of which is the RRA, but there, was, there had even been La Quena, there had been uh, the Renzururu in the, uh, the Naru, ADF, and so forth. But all those have been uh, either pacified, contained, or accommodated. And you find that all those areas are now peaceful. That's a very major achievement. That's a very major achievement. We have, uh, however, we have, do have challenges of a different kind now. Security in terms of criminality. Uh, last year, you find that uh, in the, in the Katabi and Tebe area, many women got killed. So that kind of insecurity is new. And definitely, they, we need to have an approach that ensures that um, such issue, such criminality is curbed 
possibly it has social, economic, uh, you know, uh, you know, triggers that are leading to it, or whatever it is. As government, it's our responsibility to ensure that all Ugandans uh, are secure. Then there's the issue of land tenure security. You find that many parts of Uganda, the Mairo land, uh, Uganda tenants are really living in a very uh, precarious situation. So as government, it's our responsibility to ensure that all Ugandans are secure. In the Uganda area, I think what's required is to the capitalization of the land fund, as it was done in Chibali, so that people in uh, the Mairo land in Uganda are also secure, to avoid the kind of saga we find in, in for example, involving even a minister in uh, Buyikwe, whereby even the LC1 got killed. To avoid that, we need to, 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 to double our efforts mm -hmm. to ensure that all Ugandans are secure, so that they can contribute and enjoy their being Ugandans. Mm. Mr. Chintu, one of the factors, the outstanding war now that the country is facing is the war of poverty. Mm. Where we have uh, people in rural areas, they have the land, government has come up with various initiatives, but the rate of return in fighting poverty remains a challenge. What is the problem here? 32 years, a government that was able to uh, handle gun issues, that has been able to handle all these complications. Why do we still have this absolute poverty in some areas of this country? Well, it depends. But one key area, if you have to fight poverty, is to have land tenure security. So we need to ensure that, for example, like in Uganda, in Uganda you find that the Uganda the, the tenants sustain the economy because mm. coffee, the robusta coffee that they grew, used to sustain the economy, or even the food. So if you are to have security or poverty, uh, eradication, you must have land tenure security. That's a prerequisite. Because without land tenure security, that person cannot invest his or her energy mm. into the productive sector, and then you, you, they'll be branded lazy, which is not true. No, no, no person can invest in an, in an environment of insecurity. Even the peasants are rational economic actors. So we as government, it's our responsibility to ensure that we provide that security, and then that will tremendously ensure that uh, there is economic growth in that area. That said, there are areas where that has been done, like in Chibari. I would imagine that, for example, there they are more secure, and uh, they, you know they, that they are, they, they are contributing better to the economy. Mm -hmm. There are government programs, like for example, the wealth creation. Wealth creation is uh, is intended to address the very issue you have raised to ensure that the peasants, most Ugandan peasants, or most Ugandans are staying in the rural areas. And because of that, they are in the main peasants. Now, many of them were in the sub, what they call the subsistence sector, meaning that they never interacted in the main with the, with the economy. They ate what they, they grew their own food, built their own houses, got the water from the natural spring, and so forth, and the fuel. From, from, the, from, the, from their environment. So they, they hadn't ever interacted with the marketplace unless they're buying salt or possibly paraffin. And once in a while when they go to the flea market to buy uh, you know, second-hand clothing. Now that said, that is being addressed through the Operation Wealth Creation. And I think uh, more and more of our population is being engaged in productively in the market mm. to address the very concern you have just raised. Uh, when we, as we are looking at twin, as you're looking at 32 years of liberation, mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges that have been facing our country, and one maybe would think if uh, 41 men with 27 guns were able to overturn a government, they had the will of the people, the support of the people, and they have been able to sustain a government for all these years, basing on the votes and the human resource and power. What? is so hard to fight corruption. It began people taking millions, they went to hundreds of millions, they came to billions, and now the figures are increasing. That is one of the cancers in, since the liberation struggle. All I can say is that institutions have been created to fight corruption, and um, uh, say the Auditor General is better empowered the office of the Auditor General is better empowered. And the Auditor General comes up with the reports. Now we have Parliament. Parliament also has watchdog committees that are supposed to interrogate the issue of raise of corruption. We have the institution of the IGG. 
and, and so forth. So I think the institutional framework and the laws are strengthened. Mm. So the institutional framework is there, and what's required is further political will to ensure that uh, the issue you have raised is addressed. Mm. And then finally, uh, as you look at the, at the 32 years of liberation, uh, one of the motives was to have peace, democracy, uh, freedom of expression, and ensuring that Ugandans were on course. This we've achieved, but let's look at political parties in Uganda. At the time we are going to celebrate 22 years, we are having a multi-party dispensation. And this could have been the dream of people that went to the bush to ensure that we have a system that flows normally. Research into Nyago. Just yesterday, we saw FDC divided, some saying we are not going to support this uh, initiative of Chiza SJ. As we had this move, we see the NRM also moving on. Are we on course? Did you, was this one of the desires that we see a Uganda operating this way, politically, with free political space, but wondering if you're on the right course in the time of democracy. Mr. Chiravo, to have democracy, mm. you must have Democrats. Now, what the NRM has done, I mean, it's like having Christianity. Mm. Well, to have Christianity, you must have Christians. Mm. Even if you have a Bible there, but the people are not, are not uh, uh, convinced mm. to be Christians, it won't help. Even if you have churches, the people who go to those churches must have a Christian ethos, must have a Christian philosophy, must live like Christians. Don't just behave like a Christian on Sunday when you're in church. When you leave church, as the, as the second commandment says, love your neighbor as you love yourself. You see, you must believe in one God and love your neighbor as you love yourself. Don't just, you know, be Christian when you're in church for those 30 or so minutes. Now, to have a multi-party democracy, we must have Democrats. Now, unfortunately, in the opposition, some of the leaders there are not Democrats. Like Mr. Kizabesi Jay. Mr. Kizabesi Jay attempts to impose himself on others. He does not, uh, he's not consultative. So that, that is, those are the problems. But now, on the advantages side, we as government, the NRM, we have put in place the legal political framework to enable multipartism to thrive. So Mr. Kizer, basically that's why he's having problems. He's having problems because he's trying to impose himself on other Ugandans and they don't want his work methods. Mm. Well, it's been a pleasure hosting you. Uh, that you. is uh, Ambassador uh, Chintunyago, who is Uganda's Deputy Permanent Representative to the United Nations and an NRM cadre. From the rest of the team, wishing you a lovely day. Up next is Business Today. And please stay tuned to UBC TV. Good morning.